All right, why don't we open up our Bibles to Luke 24. Luke 24, 13 to 35. And the reason why we don't have the reading of the word today is because this is a longer section. So we're going to be reading this. Luke 24, 13 to 35. And I'll, and I'll read the word of God. And behold, two of them were going that same day to a village named Emmaus, which was 60 stadia from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other about all these things which had happened. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself approached and was going with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you are discussing with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a mighty prophet in deed and word, in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also, some woman among us astounded us when they were at the tomb early in the morning. And not finding his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the woman also said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and after breaking it, he was giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to, none, and they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? And they stood up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. And they were relating their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, your word is now going to be preached. Not man's word, your word. The word of God Almighty, the creator of the universe. Your word is described as a word that cuts down to the marrow of our bones. It discerns thoughts and intentions, Lord. It's a powerful word. It's not created by man-made hands, but with eternal hands. 
and it will endure forever. Every book will pass away except for these words. Please, Father, show how great and powerful your word is to my brothers and sisters here. Show them that it can change lives. Show them that your word can change situations upside down. Show that, Lord, and glorify yourself through your word and the power through which your word cuts to the soul. Lord, let us all leave knowing that the word of Almighty God was preached today. And do that to glorify yourself and your word. Amen. Why don't we have an interesting icebreaker for today's study? Um, I want us to just be very open with something really just, maybe you've never thought about it, but let's think about this. This is a very random question, but what makes a good doctor to you? What qualities, abilities, traits does a good doctor have to you? One that listens to your needs. Okay. Listens to your needs. One that's able to <clears throat> solve the root issue. Solve the root issue. So think about in your life. What are some things? You go either dentist or, you know, any just family doctor. What is it? One that's empathetic. Empathetic. It has to be like a good faith doctor. Like if the doctor doesn't believe that he can help you, he won't strive to help you. Okay. But like they have to like want to have that drive to do it. Knowledgeable. Knowledgeable. Okay. He cares more for you than the money. <clears throat> cares more for you than the money. What else? What are some bad qualities in a doctor? He cares more about the money than you. <laughs> yeah, he cares more about He's the giving money. drugs. Like whenever you don't go to the root problem, you just assign drugs. Right? Yeah. <coughs> so knowledgeable, listens, doesn't cares more about you than the money. Uh, anything else? Any other qualities that stick out to you of the times you've had? You're like, that's a good doctor right there. Gentle. Gentle. Right? Does that doesn't that like increase your like make you happier when you visit the doctor? Huh? Relatable. Relatable. I would also say like truthful, because I remember when I was younger, my doctor would tell me like I need to lose weight and I'll take that personally. But like it's important it's important they're truthful. Yeah, truthful, right? Right. That that matters. That matters. Anyone else? Serge has never had a good doctor's experience. He's <laughs> shaking his head. No good doctors in Lebanon. <laughs> I think doctors that, um, like for me, is that they go like herbal medicine rather than like actual. Herbal medicine. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's interesting, and th these things will come to mind as we go through the rest of our story. Um, the name of my study today is Hope for Backsliders. <clears throat> Hope for Backsliders. What is backsliding? Can someone give a brief overview of what does it mean to backslide in the Christian life? What is backsliding? Mm -hmm. Personally, I would say it's like whenever you're losing motivation in your position, you Okay. You're just finding it more difficult to set time aside for God. Yeah, okay. Instead of being sanctified and growing up, moving forward, you're going back to your old ways, bad habits. Okay. Anyone else? There's one more person on backsliding. What is backsliding? So the same as well, that you had like when you were doing things, just the love for the word of God. Okay, so, you know, lack of motivation, not being sanctified, not moving forward, losing love. Backsliding is when a Christian begins to act like the old man more than the new man. It's when they are, they've for a season, they've gone back to their old way of life. For a season. 
for a temporary season, they've gone back and they've been entangled in sins as a born again believer. As a born again believer. Non believers don't backslide, they're dead in sins, right? We're talking about an, a, a Christian who is genuinely saved, but they actually go back in a season of being entangled in their old way of life. Maybe a sin that you thought was gone comes up and then you fall into it again and it, it's glue. In our story today, in this odd story, it's unique to Luke's gospel, in Luke 24, 13 to 35. I want you to look at this text. The main theme of this text is Jesus' resurrection. That's the main theme of what's going on here. Because Christ has just been resurrected, and we read last week about hardened hearts on Resurrection Sunday. We went through various types of people who had hardened hearts, and no one was really believing that Jesus resurrected. In fact, in Luke's Gospel, this is the first appearance of Christ Himself after the resurrection, the story we're at today. And Jesus appears to, who? verse 13, and behold, two of them. So we have two disciples here. One of their names is Cleopas. We never hear of him anywhere before or after. And we don't even know the other guy's name. And the story ends here for these two guys. We never hear about them before, we never hear about them after. But they're here in our story. And uh, they're in a backslidden place. These once joyful disciples of Christ who were likely screaming and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, have now come to a place of such utter despair that they're convinced that Jesus is not even the Messiah. That's crazy backsliding. That's some crazy despair and sin that they've entangled themselves in. But what does it say right here in verse 21? We were hoping that it was He who was going to redeem Israel. Why does it say we, we were hoping that it was He who was going to redeem Israel? Because at the time, all the Jews thought that the Messiah would come and save them from Roman rule. They, they thought, just like Moses saved them out of Egypt, oh, the Messiah would come and free us from Rome. But they had a completely wrong understanding of the Messiah. So the second they saw he died, they're like, all right, this can't be the guy because he's dead. How is he going to free us from Rome? He's dead. So they've officially lost hope. And they came to Jerusalem because of Passover. And they're going home. They're going home. And they're leaving all their hopes of a Messiah behind in Jerusalem. They're in a very, very sad place. If you look with me in verse 13, and behold, two of them were going that same day to a village named Emmaus. We know nothing about this place, Emmaus. Really, it's just a nothing place. <laughs> it's just some village that no one really cares about. It's not some noticeable place. There's maybe a couple of huts there, and that's it. Um, and it was 60 stadia from Jerusalem, seven miles. So this is a two and a half hour walk that they're going from Jerusalem to some village called Emmaus. And they're walking, two people. And they were conversing with each other about all these things. What are they talking about? What are they talking about? Yeah, so they're talking about all the stuff that have occurred in the past. Um, all these things regarding Jesus, because that's where the, that's where we are in our context. And um, what's interesting, I want us to know is that when Jesus approached them, it says they stood still, looking sad. A stranger appeared to them. It says their eyes were prevented from seeing Jesus. Some mir some miraculous divine. Thing occurs in their mind where Jesus literally approaches them and they think it's a stranger. They think it's a stranger. But one thing I want us to know about how bad and backslidden they were. Whenever this stranger approaches them, they don't even try and put on a fake face. They don't even try and put on a smile. You know how you're, if you, most people, they express their sadness to people closest to them, if they even do. And if, let's say, someone you're not as close to comes, you're just like, you kind of put on a smile and, you know, talk with them and greet them until they go home. 
A stranger walked up to these guys and they don't even try and put on a smile. They're in a really bad place, very bad place, that they're not even concerned about proper manners or even trying to look like they're in a good place at all. Their sadness is written all over their face. And it says they were talking about all these things which had happened. What are they talking about? They're saying stuff like, oh, remember those sermons that he preached? Remember that sermon that he preached? Remember the miracle you performed during Passover last year? Wasn't it mind-blowing? They're hung up about the past. They're hung up about their past. And there's no discussion about any future event, right? They're just talking about the past. Hung up about the past. And dear believers, don't some of you and some of us live our Christian life that way? Always hung up about something about the past. Always hung up about some past sins that you've committed, that you just can't move forward with. A past event that maybe touched you, and you're just living in the past. There's a pastor, one of my favorite pastors, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he was, he was a doctor. He was actually the doctor of the Buckingham Palace, and then he came to save his faith in Christ. And some, he was asked to look at someone, to take care of someone. So they said, hey, there's a school teacher, and he's not doing well. He's not, he hasn't been doing well for 15 years. And Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones went to him and was, began to talk to him. Said, What's happened? Why are you in this place? And he was saying, well, in World War I, I was in a submarine, and they hit our submarine, and we went down to the bottom, and my life just forever changed, out. My, and my life forever changed afterwards. After they hit our submarine and we sank to the bottom of the sea. And Martin Lloyd-Jones, what happened next? Like, that's what happened. We just, the submarine got hit and then we were just at the bottom. He's like, what's the end of the story though? He's like, that is the end of the story. And this man was plagued ill for 15 years in the mind. And Martin Lloyd-Jones recognized that this guy has been living in the past. This guy hasn't moved forward from World War I for 15 years. And he told him that. He's like, you think that's the end of the story. You're here in front of me. You're not at the bottom of the sea. But to see the power of the mind, that just if you were to think about living the past in your mind, you're not going to live properly in the present. How can you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength if your mind is half preoccupied in the past? You see, Proverbs says, as a man thinks, so he is. And some of us live our Christian life that way, hung up about the past. That's what these backsliders are doing, living in the past. No concern about future hope and despair. And then Jesus comes. Can someone read verse 17? And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Okay. And can you read verse 18 and 19 as well? <clears throat> then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Okay, so Jesus approaches them, and he as a stranger, very gently, very friendly, he approaches them and just gives them two questions, right? Two questions is what we have. And he says, what are these words that you are discussing with one another as you are walking? And they said, they literally dropped dead like, are you stupid? Are you the only guy living under a rock who doesn't know what's happened? I said this before, but this is as if like some guy lives in Long Island, New York. And the World Trade Center just fell down. And the guy comes out a week later and he's like, what the heck is all these cops doing here? This was how big Jesus' death was. That it was shocking that someone would come and say, what are you guys talking about? What do you think we're talking about? What just happened? Right? So Jesus, was, this is like a huge celebrity's death. That very popular man has just died. And they're shocked that this stranger, who was Jesus himself, <laughs> saying something like this. My, the name of my study was Hope for Backsliders. And in our text for today, 
I want us to look at three things that Jesus does which can help each of us reach full recovery from our backsliding. You guys hear that? I'll repeat myself. In our text for today, I want us to look at three things that Jesus does to these two disciples, which can help us here today reach full recovery from our personal backsliding. And number one is this. He asks them two questions. Why does he ask them two questions? Did Jesus, is he asking two questions because he's genuinely lost as to what they're talking about? No. No. Right? Jesus is God. He knows all things. He's not sitting here and asking them what's going on, right? He's not doing that. He's, he knows what's happened. He's the one who died. <laughs> he's the one who died. So he's not asking these questions because he has some lack of information. Why do you guys think he's asking them that? Huh? To test them for them to realize. For them to think about and ponder on their answers. Okay. So they can be honest about it. I, I believe Jesus, what he what he's doing. Go ahead. Well, I, I think uh, kind of right off the back of the other answers just now, he's leading them to mm -hmm. verse 25, you know, where, where he's saying, Oh, foolish man is so hard to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Uh, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? You know, and then he goes on. But, um, yeah, I think he's pulling their opinions and their thoughts out of them to lead them to that and to say, you should have known what the scripture said. Mm -hmm. Right. One important thing that I want us to understand as to what Jesus is doing here is he's not asking a question so that he can get something, so that he can gain something. He's asking this question so that they can gain something. What do I mean? What Jesus is doing is Jesus is asking these questions. Jesus is asking these questions to these two disciples so that they can unravel their heart to him. Well, that's what he's doing. He's, he knows what's happened and he knows all the information that's happened. But what he's doing is he's asking these questions so that they can unravel, unwind their heart towards him. Uh, doctors ask their patients question on a scale of 1 to 10, how bad are you feeling? Right? They say, what are your symptoms? They go and say, um, well, how long have you been feeling this? Where do you feel the pain? When do you feel the pain? And they ask questions so that they can give a solution. But Jesus has his patients, his followers, unwind their hearts so that they can be healed. You see, human doctors have us talk so that they can give a solution. But talking to the great physician himself is a remedy for backsliders on its own. Jesus doesn't need to know any information. He knows these guys front to back. He knows the situation front to back. This is for their benefit. This is for their benefit. It's prayer. This is the first thing I want us to understand about people who are backsliding. The first remedy Jesus gives these people is he calls them to unravel their hearts to him. Talk to me. Be honest with me. You tell me what's on your heart. What's going on? Honesty in prayer. Coming to the Lord in your backslidden state and telling Him exactly how you're feeling, what emotions you're feeling. If you're hopeless, telling Him that. Everything. Unwinding your heart to Him. And this is the first step in backsliding. Wherever you are in your faith, you need to be honest with Christ. You need to be honest with Him. And guys, I want us to understand this. Those who are backsliding in this room are often very distant in their communication with the Lord. They're very distant in their communications with the Lord. Yeah, I pray at night. Yeah, I'll just pray occasionally from here and there, whenever I remember. You see, that's the problem for people who are backsliding. 
they're not in active conversation with the great physician. They're not in active conversation. And there is immense healing in just talking to Jesus about what you're going through, about how you're feeling. That's why he's asking a question. He knows everything. He knows what they were going to say, but this is for their benefit, not his. And you, we all, wherever you're at in life, whatever you're struggling with, you need to be transparent with your Savior. Transparent with him. And you need to lay aside your formal prayers. Lay aside your formal prayers and talk to the Lord. Speak to the Lord. Unravel your heart to the Lord. Picture Christ coming up to you and saying this. Artin, what is this that you are thinking? He knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> what are, that's, a, that's an important way to understand. If you want to open up to the Lord... Picture Christ himself coming up to you and saying, Mike, what is it that you're going through? Gala, what's on your mind? Vahag, what's confusing you? And you know what the KJV says of this verse in verse 17? It says this. Only the KJV says this. It says, And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have with one another as ye walk and are sad? Arti, what's making you sad? That will for sure open up your heart to the Lord. And you need to automatically realize that. That Christ asked these questions to his disciples to open them up. And it's almost as if he's doing the same today. What's on your mind, really? It's almost the Lord is saying that to you today. I think one cause for backsliding is has to, that has to do with this is hiding things from God. Like having the wrong view of God. Or that he's like constantly angry. Or that having worldly sorrow. That like if you confess to him what you're doing or be transparent with him that he's going to punish you or be angry with you but that's just foolish because we're well, what are we hiding he knows our heart better than we do he knows every single intention we have everything we're doing while we're doing it and when we pray those types of prayers that are like you know this shield trying to to hide from god what we're doing or feeling it's just it, 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 it goes against this right here because he's compassionate he's slow to anger and he knows our heart better than he does uh, better than we do so i think that's a cause for just false like the wrong type of praying yes if you're in any backslidden place just know this you have to be in active honest transparent conversation with the lord who's the only one who can heal you i mean honest i mean honest right the did not these emmaus disciples say this what did they say in verse um they said in verse 21, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Listen, if there's a sin in your life that you're just dead hopeless about, tell the Lord that. Tell the Lord that. Tell him. Be honest. Lord, I've tried this sin so many times, it just keeps coming back. But just say it as it is. If you feel hopeless, tell him you're hopeless. The Lord doesn't hear long prayers. He doesn't hear formal prayers. He hears genuine prayers. Honest cries of the heart is what the Lord hear, hears. How are human doctors like? Do they ever call you and ask if you're sick? But Jesus is the one who initiated this entire conversation, right? Jesus, the physician, is the one who comes after us and says, hey, let's make an appointment. I have a question. Um, there's been times where I've noticed that even myself, um, where it's like I'm in sin or I'm committing a sin and I'm actually scared to pray about it not because I'm scared of God's anger but because I know I'm going to do it again tomorrow or I'll be like I can't even like ask for forgiveness because it's shameful to me because I know that tomorrow I'm going to be angry about it again or tomorrow I'm going to say something again or like things like that where I notice and I pray where it's like God like um like, I, I, like, you feel hopeless in it, and it's like, I don't know what to do to, like, distract yourself, but sometimes you're scared to pray about it and, like, go even deeper into it because I don't want to be that person that asks for forgiveness and then does it again the next day. How would you say you should go about What it? you told me is what you're supposed to tell the Lord, exactly as you said. Coming to the Lord and saying, I'm afraid to approach you because I, I know I'm going to do this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's the solution, and that's what I'm getting at. It's not some, she asked for advice and I'm going to give something secret that I just didn't tell you guys. What she said is how you're supposed to approach the Lord. 
In, in the book of Psalms, that's exactly how the psalmist prayed. However they were feeling, they told the Lord. Mm -hmm. However they were feeling, they told the Lord. You see David, if he's in a bad mood, he tells the... You, there's some psalms that you read where David is in a bad mood in the beginning and by the end of it he's in some crazy good mood. Because there is a healing in you being honest with the Lord. I promise you there is a great healing in this. And here's an encouragement that I want you to know, believer. That Jesus longs to hear from you. He longs with all his soul to hear your prayer. He's on the edge of his seat to just hear your prayer. Why do I say it? Where do we see that in the text? Where do we see that in the text? I'm saying that the Lord is very earnest, eager, longing to hear a prayer like that. Where do I see that in the text? Jesus asks two questions, right? Two questions to open up the heart of these two believers. The first question, who responds? Who responds to the first question? Cleopas. Cleopas. One person, right? One person responds. And he says, are you the only one in Jerusalem who had, doesn't know what's going on? What could have Jesus said? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I know. I heard actually on the way here. I was... But what does he do? What does he do? He asks another question. Right? He asks one question and only one person responds. And then he asks another question and then who responds? They. they right you see that both of them respond the second time the guy who wouldn't even know his name Jesus asks a question because he's trying to draw out the hearts in honest confession and one of them maybe Cleopas was the extrovert opens up but the other man is just standing quietly and then he asked another question. Maybe he even looked at that other guy and said, what things? And then the other guy starts talking to him. What do I want us to see from that? Is that Jesus wants both of them to open up their heart. Jesus wants, there are some people in this room who are very open in prayer. They can tell how they're feeling to the Lord in public settings, in prayer. But there are some people who struggle with prayer a lot. They just are more reserved in prayer. They're more, they, prayer is more difficult for them. And something like this is supposed to show that Jesus wants all his people to come and pray to him. Those who are easy to communicate with him and those who have a harder time. Like you. Those who have a harder time. Those who just can't get to even say the words, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry for this. It's those people that Christ comes and says, I want to hear you as well. It's those people. It's the people who are reserved, who struggle with prayer, and just really don't know how to open up their heart to even the Lord. To even the Lord. It's those very people that Christ wants to hear from as well. And guys, no matter what sin it is that's in your life, know this, that Jesus will never ignore your prayer. He will always help you out. If you come to him in honesty and saying, Lord, I don't even want to pray to you, but I'm going to. That's how I feel, Lord. I don't even want to pray right now. Do you pray like that? You should pray like that. That's honesty and that's genuineness. If you come to the Lord in all honesty, and I testify to this, guys. I am a living witness. Try him. Go to him and see for yourself. Go to him and see for yourself and see if he'll cast you away. See if he won't help you. That's what I'm saying. I'm putting it on the table right now. Try going to him like that and see if he'll cast you away. See if he won't help you. Because guess what? Not only will he help you, but he's so eager to help you. These guys spoke for two minutes and Jesus spoke to them for two and a half hours. Do you see that? And oftentimes, whenever we come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm just tired. This sin has been along for too long, and I know it's not going to get better, because that's how I feel. I assure you, that one-minute prayer, Christ will help you one hour, one month, one year. As he did with these disciples. They talked for a few minutes. And Jesus, Jesus says, great, glad you were honest. Step aside. Let's talk. Let me heal you. 
Let me fix you. That thing that you're hopeless about, let me fix you. And he speaks for two and a half hours. We give him this, and he's so abounding in love. He's so, he has so much compassion, so much desire to fix those who are his. He will overflow in help. See for yourself. If I'm a liar, come back and tell me. He won't reject you. He will help you. Honesty and prayer changes everything. And both of them start talking. Mission accomplished, right? He opens up their hearts. And this is what they say. The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a mighty prophet in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people. What does that mean? In the sight of God and all the people. It says Jesus was the same person behind the scenes and in front of the crowd. No hypocrisy. Jesus Christ had 0% hypocrisy. We do. He didn't. He was the same person in front of his parents and in front of the crowds when he was giving the sermon. No hypocrisy. In the sight of God and all the people. So they're even saying good things about Jesus, even though they've lost hope. And it says, And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. They don't say the Romans did it. They say the religious leaders did it. And we were hoping it was he who was going to redeem Israel. You see their honesty? They don't play it. They don't say, oh, we're his disciples. They just say it as it is. They say it as it is. They don't even care this is a stranger. They don't even know it's Christ. And look at what it said. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. When did the third day begin? 6 p.m. the day before. Because the time began for Jews, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's how it began. Ours is 12, 12 to 12. Theirs was 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. Because they went based off sunset. And so it's almost done. It's almost Monday to them. And they're like, where is he? It's been all day he's not here. It's been the third day for about... 20, 18 hours, he's not here. What do you mean the third day? He's not here. It says some woman among us astounded us when they were at the tomb. But him, and then it says some of those who were with us went to the tomb, found it exactly as the woman also said, but him they did not see. They finish off on those last words. Why? Because it's, it's, a, it's a sign of, that's why we're sad. Because he's not here. And we've lost all hope that he's going to be here. He's dead in the grave. That's what they think. Our, number, our solution number one that Jesus the physician does for backsliding believers is he listens to them when they unravel their heart. Prayer is the first thing you need to do, backsliding believer. Unravel your heart to the Lord. Don't go to the next step until you've done that. What's number two? What is the second thing Jesus does to backsliders? He diagnoses them. He gives his doctor's diagnosis. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. The KJV says, oh, fools. Fools. He calls them fools. Is there room in your view of Jesus, for a Jesus that calls his disciples fools? Or do you have a, oh, Jesus is love only type of Jesus? What kind of view do you have of our Lord? He came and called his own fools. Fools. Foolish men. Foolish ones. What did he call Peter when he said, you're never going to go to the cross? What did he tell Peter? Satan. Get behind me, Satan. This is the Jesus of the Bible. He speaks like this. This is Jesus' honest diagnosis. As Amon said, what does a good doctor do? They tell you the truth. They tell you the truth. But I want us to understand this. What did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount about the word fool? Do you remember what he said about that? What did he say about if you call your brother fool? What did he say? Murder. And it says, if you call your brother a fool, you've murdered him in your heart and you're liable to hellfire. That's what he said. So why is he now turning and calling these people fools, <laughs> right? 
He tells people on the Sermon on the Mount, don't call people fools. And he's like, you foolish people, you fools. It's a different word in the Greek. <laughs> it's a different word. The word in the Greek in the Sermon on the Mount implies contempt. This one doesn't. It's not, it's not the same word. This, is, this just means thoughtless. Like you're just being ignorant. You're being silly. But this, the original, it, does, it's, it doesn't imply condemnation. It doesn't imply contempt. This is not like Jesus is backhanding him across the face. You want to say something? Oh, I was just going to say pretty similar to what you were aware uh, in the law. It's, it's addressing a hard attitude, like you said, that contempt. Yeah. Uh, whereas purely calling someone out as doing something dumb is different. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what he's doing is the word is different. So this word means like thoughtless. You're being thoughtless. In Armenian, it says unmeet men. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me this. The doctor who urgently tells you to stop smoking because you're going to die, is that unloving? No, that's very loving. If they urgently tell you, you're going to die within the next year if you don't stop smoking. How about the father who has a young six-year-old and they're out let's say at the mall and they're at the parking lot and that young kid is walking around and then the, the father sees a car about to hit the son what does the son what does the father say hey, hey son come here, come here. <laughs> son come here like urgently loud now whisper is not going to do in a moment like that is the father being unloving no the doctor who says you're going to die if you don't stop this is not being unloving. They're being loving because it's an urgent situation. The father who would yell at their child like that, get out of the way, is loving them. Why? Because there is a great danger, right? That's why it's loving. So Jesus also speaks like this because there is a great danger in, this, in these two disciples. In their backslidden condition. They're in a dangerous place. Very dangerous place. What's the danger? A hardened heart. We spoke about last week. About the danger of a hardened heart. It's fatal. It's incredibly dangerous. Don't think you can dabble in sin. And think you're fine. It says in Hosea. You sow the wind and you will reap the whirlwind. Whatever you sow, that you'll also reap. Don't mess with sin. It'll harden your heart, and you will face the consequences. There's, no, there's never been a case ever where someone sinned, and they didn't face the consequences, because Jesus' words are true. Whatever you sow, that you will also reap. It's true. So Jesus is very urgently warning them of the danger of the condition that they have slid into and he sees how dangerous it is to have a hardened heart. And he lovingly urges them as that loving doctor would, as that loving father would. Why do you think the author of Hebrews warns so sharply in Hebrews 3.12, Beware, brothers, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. You know what a hardened heart does? It slowly leads you away from the living God. That's what it does. If you have a hardened heart, that's what's going on, and you don't even know it. It doesn't have to be this steep of a slide. Just like this, you're sliding away from the Lord. Just like that. At a pace that you don't even recognize. Number one was prayer, right? That's what he said. Backsliders need to unravel their hearts in honest prayer. Number two is that Jesus diagnosed these disciples. So do you know what you, prayer you have to pray? Psalm 139, 23 to 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. You have to pray that. After you've unpacked your heart to the Lord, after you've poured out your heart in honest prayer, genuine prayer, transparent prayer to the Lord. You know what you should finish that prayer off with? Best prayer. Why don't you go there? Psalm 139. 
23 to 24. Mark that down in your Bible. Highlight it. Write it. Do something. But keep this in mind. This is the way you go to Jesus the physician for a spiritual checkup. This is it. Search my heart, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me. You know what the psalmist is praying? He's saying, Lord, I don't know what's in my soul. I don't know what evil ways I'm doing because I'm blinded. I can't see. Show me. Show me the things that are in me that I'm not seeing that I'm doing. I assure you guys, I know as someone who has backslidden, I know that when you're in a backsliding season, do not think you have 2020 vision on your own condition. The person who is backslidden is actually in a deception. They can't really see as well. Their vision is impaired. The, the Christian who's been obedient, healthy, confessing, close to the Lord, softening their heart, is one who can properly see their own condition. What did Jesus say about people who um, look to their neighbor and call them out? What did he say? First, get the speck out of your own eye. Get that log out of your own eye because you can't see when you're backsliding. You can't evaluate your condition when you're backsliding. And I look back on the times where I have backslidden. I assure you guys, I thought I was doing fine. I really thought I wasn't in that bad of a place. But when, I, when the Lord got me out of there, now I look back, I'm like, oh my goodness, what wasn't I saying? So right now, very well could be, there's things in your life that you're not saying. This very second, you need to be praying, search my heart, oh God. Try me. Don't be arrogant enough to think you know your own soul well enough. You don't know your own soul well enough. What does Jeremiah say? The heart is what, above all things? Deceitful, right? You don't trust your heart. What, is, what, is the most, what does it say under in and out cups? Come on. Even non-believers know this verse. What does it say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean what? Not on your own. Not on your own understanding. The heart is deceitful above all things. Don't think you know everything about your heart. You don't know it. You don't know. I don't know. This very second. I don't know all the things that the Lord is saying. This, because I'm born in sin. And we were singing in the song. In sin did my mother conceive me. You need to be praying, search my heart, oh God. Have you been neglecting that prayer? Has that prayer been racking dust in your heart? That's the thing you need to ask yourself. You know what Martin Lloyd-Jones said? Because he was a doctor. He's like, in my time of medicine, I never let a patient diagnose or prescribe the medication for his own condition. It's not up to you to tell the Lord, Lord, I need this. <laughs> you don't know what you need. That's why you're supposed to go to him and say, Lord, this is how I'm feeling. I'm sad. There might be a reason why in your life there might be sadness. There might be a deep spiritual problem. Sin can never make you happy. Never. So that's why you're supposed to be honest. And at the end of your honesty, Lord, search my heart. Do a checkup on me. Do a spiritual EKG on me. Wire me up, but try me. Test me. What's in my heart? I can't see it. This is how backsliders can be healed. Honesty and pray the prayer. Search my God. Search my heart, O oh God. And pray with humility. Whatever the Lord brings to your attention, embrace it and submit to it. Don't wrestle against it. Right? You know what these disciples could have said? Who the heck do you think you are calling me a fool? <laughs> right? They could have said that. Like, what did you just say to us? So that humility, that humility of mind is what we need. Solution number one, prayer, honest prayer. Solution two, Jesus' diagnosis. You should also be praying for him to diagnose you. How well you're doing spiritually. I was reading today in 2 Corinthians. Every single believer is going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And Christ is going to reward every good thing you did and every bad thing you did. It's only a matter of maybe 60 years where every single person in this room is going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And he's going to mention the stuff that you did earlier today. 
earlier today. And he's going to say, what about this? I'm glad that you prayed to me earlier today. Good, you're going to get this reward. But I saw that you thought about this. So let's ask that the Lord would diagnose us. Because the sooner we're well, our judgment will be easier when we are before him, right? You want to say something? Mm -hmm. That's solution one, solution two. And be encouraged that Jesus doesn't deal with non-believers like this. He doesn't. It says the prayer of a non-believer is an abomination to the Lord. If you, you have the privilege of going to him in honest prayer, and praying something like this. And we come to our last solution. What does he say? Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Can someone turn on the AC? He takes them to the word of God, right? That's what Jesus does. He takes them to the Word of God. You know what God describes His own Word as in Jeremiah 23? He says, Is not my Word like fire? Is not my Word like fire, declares Yahweh, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Once you've prayed your heart out, Run to the Word of God and let the Word of God heal your heart. That's the only way we as believers can be healed from our backside. Do you know, read Psalm 119, do you know what David repeats over and over and over again? Revive me according to your Word. Revive me according to your Word. Revive me according to your Word. This guy doesn't... doesn't Change his words. He keeps on saying that all throughout Psalm 119. Revive me according to your word. This is the steps you need to take. Pray your heart out. Search my heart. Run to the word of God. Expose yourself to the fire of the word of God. And it will cleanse you in a way that chemotherapy never does. What does chemotherapy do? Doesn't it kill all your cells? Right? That's why people are weak after chemotherapy. <clears throat> Well, you know what the Word of God does? It doesn't make you weaker. It kills off all those sin cells in you. And it strengthens the good ones, the healthy ones. That's what the Word of God does. And you know what's an encouragement? This is, you've probably heard many people say, be in the Word more, be in the Word more. But I'm encouraging you this. Being in a backslidden place, it's hard to do spiritual things, right? It's hard to even get in the Word. I'm encouraging you, just get in the Word and the Word of God will do the cleansing. Not you. You just put yourself in the Word. And it'll miraculously cleanse your heart the more you read it daily. The more you read it. More exposure to the Word of God means more recovery from backsliding. Less exposure to the Word of God, less recovery. Quality time in the Word. That's what he said. He saw their problem and said, you guys have a wrong idea about who the Messiah is. They only thought that the Messiah would come and just bring prosperity. But he says, what about Isaiah 53? He was crushed for our iniquities. What about Psalm 22? What about those verses? They had a wrong understanding of the word. Tell me this. Let's say some of us might be doing so bad in the Christian walk. You might need way more exposure to the Word than other people. Tell me this. How can the mechanic fix seven major problems on your car if you do not leave the car with the mechanic and his tools? How can he? Tell me how he can do it. He can't unless you leave the car with him and with his tools. Tell me how can a heart surgeon perform heart surgery, open heart surgery in 15 minutes? How can someone with stage 3 cancer expect to be fully healed in one week? So same with you. If you truly desire to recover from your backslidden place, you must allow Jesus the physician to thoroughly clean you through his word. We, we sang Psalm 51. Do you know what David prays in that psalm? 
wash me thoroughly. Thoroughly wash me from my sin. If you want that to be your prayer, don't just say it with your words, but make sure you bring yourself to the Lord and say, do your work in me through your word. And they just hear a sermon that just blows their mind, right? They just hear everything that they needed to hear from the word of God. That's still available to us. And it says this, can someone read verse 28? Let's see what happens. Let's see how Jesus is. This is a story about Jesus recovering these two backslidden disciples. What does Jesus do in verse 28? What does it say happens in verse 28? Someone read 28 and 29. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. Okay, so they got to their village, right? It's sunset. It's already, it's already evening. And then it says Jesus acted as, he, as if he were going farther. It doesn't mean he was playing a game or anything. Other translations just say that he would have gone farther. He really would have. But they stopped him. So it wasn't some play on games that he did. And then it says they strongly urged him to stay with us. Strongly. Like this is some, they just met this guy and they're strong, strongly urging him into their home. As I just told some of you guys to read more of the Word of God, do you know what some of you guys thought? A hardening of your heart is over you because of your backslidden place. And though you didn't say it in your heart, maybe you did, but though you didn't say it in your heart, you're like, deep, deep down, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good where I'm at. That's a hardened heart. That's a hardened heart. A heart that's resistant to the Word. I just encourage you guys, read the word more. And some of you guys just, you know, that's a hard heart. You know what's an encouragement? To those people who do read the word more, you will desire it more naturally. Do you guys understand that? That should be an encouragement to you. They just heard the word preach for two and a half hours. And guess what's their reaction? Yeah, let's go inside. You've been talking for too long. They urge him into their house because they want to hear more. If you want to have more quality time in the Word, very simple tip. Tomorrow, put an alarm clock that you're going to read for an hour. And don't just read until that hour and watch the next day. You've already pushed up your reading life. And it'll happen again. It'll again. There was a time where I would read like crazy in my faith. And guess what? The more you do it, it just sets you up better for the future. The more you put yourself in the Word, the more you're going to desire to read it. That's why you don't desire to read it that much right now. Because you don't read it enough already. If you don't read it enough already, how can you expect to desire it more? You want to desire it more? Read it more. Read it more. And look what happens. And it happened that when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And after breaking it, he was giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. Huh? Just this. They got, they got to the table. He gives them the meal. Just they recognize him that last second and he's gone. I think there's a reason why this happened. Because I think, you know what Jesus is trying to show? You don't need to see some crazy encounter with me. You need the word of God. Amen? You need the word of God. To this day, there are people who say, If only I saw a vision. If only I had a dream. If only the, an angel would come and talk to me in, oh, when I'm asleep at night. You don't need that. You need the Word of God. That's what you need. And there's a reason why He just shows up and He's like, I'm gone because you don't need that. <laughs> you don't need to see me more. You need the Word. That's why He spent two and a half hours talking about the Word and one second showing them in, Himself. That's what we need. We need the Word. That's why, I, I think that's the reason why He veiled Himself this whole time. Because if He showed Himself to begin with, they would not have paid attention to the Word. They would have been so fogged up and 
mind would have been elsewhere. Look what it said, verse 32. Someone read that. This is a, what a verse, verse 32. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Okay. What does this mean? Let's get some brainstorming. What does it mean? Did not our hearts burn within us while he spoke to us from the word? Like we're supposed to be moving our way in it. Okay. Did not our hearts burn? Their affections and their their mind got on fire for Christ and excited, and they started to realize. Every time the word of God is preached accurately, born again believers love it. They love it. It lights up a a fire of that's the that's the word of God, and I want to hear that. That's what the word of God does. It just lights you up. Yes, yes, I want the word. I want the I want more of it. And whenever it's preached faithfully, accurately, with the proper interpretation, it lights a fire in your soul. I want more. I want it. And it makes you, it gives you a joy unspeakable. It fills you with joy. Here's something I have to say. The happiest people are the people who are in the word most. The people who are the most joyful are the people who are in the word most. In the beginning of the story, it said they were sad and slow of heart because they had a wrong idea of the scriptures. They were distant from the scriptures. I assure you, there are some people here who are just sad. Your heart is sad. And you know what Martin Lloyd-Jones says? He was a doctor. You know, you know, how, you know how you know people are sad? By their face. <laughs> by their face. If someone is sad, they can't hide it. <laughs> you can't hide it. He's like, that's basic, that's basic just psychology. It's on their face. So like they stood still looking sad. You know what's another reason for you to be in the Word of God? It'll show on your face. There will be a glow on your face. Because you'll be meeting with the Lord every day. What happened with Moses when he spent a month with the Lord? He came down with his face glowing. The happiest Christians are the people who are most in the Word. Christians who are dry and in a sad place are people who, maybe they do read the Word, but they don't try and have quality time. They're maybe checking boxes. They don't see it as communion. That's a motivation, right? Don't choose to stay sad. Be happy and be in the Word. Be joyful and be in the Word. And they were so fired up that they literally, in the middle of the night, go back to Jerusalem. They were literally seven miles. They go back in darkness. It could have been wild animals. They didn't even care. They didn't even care. They go back. And they probably get around back to Jerusalem at about nine o'clock. Nine o'clock at night. And they find the 11 apostles. They started in the most sorrowful place. And now they're in a place of joy unspeakable. You know why? Because of the Word of God. Transparency, praying that the Lord would give the right diagnosis of your heart, and spend time, quality time daily with the Word of God. That's the recipe, the practical step by step tutorial for how backsliders can be healed. Isaiah 42 3 can summarize this entire passage in one verse. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. If you're barely uh, surviving in your Christian life, there's hope for you, if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, man, the best news is human doctors, now whether they have a cure for cancer, we're not going into conspiracies, but how many diseases are there that we don't have a cure? We don't have a cure, sorry. We're working, we're doing our research, we don't have a cure. The good thing about Jesus, is no matter, don't think your case is too far gone if you're a believer. He has all the medicine in the world to heal you. You just need to be honest because he has it. Is that not an encouragement? Though you might feel hopeless, know that he has specific medication that can heal your soul. He has it. Never feel that you're lost or there's no hope for me. 
Literally, there's medicine just for your name. He just pulls it out from heaven and tranquilizes you with it. Um, that's the good news, that Jesus never runs out of spiritual medicine. He cares for us. Does it not say in Ephesians chapter 1? We have every spiritual blessing available to us. Everything is available to the Christian. So, take care of your souls well. You know what a doctor would say the second you leave his doctor's office? Make sure you get your sunlight, take your vitamins, take, take these things, and uh, make sure you stay away from the chips, soda, don't do that. At Jesus' doctor's office, he says, stay close to me, talk to me, be in my word, and stay far away from sin. Because sin will ruin you. And it'll show on your face. Because sin made no person happy. Right? Sin made no person happy ever. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would all individually, starting with me, Make, give us the right medicine that we need. Diagnose us. Heal us. Give us a new hunger for your word. All of us. Give us a brand new hunger for your word. And please allow us to enter the best days of our faith. That's, that's my prayer. That we would enter the best days of our faith. And a new hunger for your word is what we ask for. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.